Hi everybody. So in this lecture, I'd like to continue with our discussion of scaling laws for nanoscience and nanotechnology. If you haven't watched the previous lecture on scaling laws for mechanics, you might want to watch that one before you watch this lecture. So here we go, scaling laws for electricity and magnetism. Now remember from the last lecture, what we meant here by scaling laws is how the magnitude of a phenomenon changes as the characteristic dimension, which I'll refer to as capital D, of the material changes. Okay? Now these scaling laws aren't meant to be held as you know, fundamental equations, but rather a guide as to how the magnitude of the phenomenon will change as the characteristic dimension changes. Okay? So um, if you need to figure out specifically for a research project or whatever exactly how this phenomenon is going to change, you'll need to do a little bit more fundamental research into what's going on and maybe even some experiments. But this is just meant to be a guide. What would you expect? Okay, so with that disclaimer, here we go. So first I'm going to start off with the resistance of a material. From our, you know, 1000 level physics courses, our freshman year, we remember that the equation for the resistance of an ohmic material is R, the resistance, is equal to rho L over A. Rho is the resistivity of the material, which is a fundamental material property that you can look up in various tables. L is the length of your ohmic material, and A is the cross-sectional area of the ohmic material. So here, the cross-sectional area is the area that's perpendicular to the flow of current, okay? All right, now, if you look at this, if we hold the resistivity as being a fundamental property of the material that doesn't change with size, which may not be true, okay? But if we hold that as a constant, then we use the characteristic dimension here. If the length of the material scales is d, and the um, cross-sectional area of the material scales as d squared, then that would mean that the resistance would scale as 1 over d. Now what this tells us is that even materials that are good conductors in the bulk can be more resistive when they approach nanoscale size, and this is a phenomenon that we see that's quite common. Let me do an example problem so that you see what I mean by these scaling laws, okay? So here it says, what's the resistance of a cubic micrometer of copper? How much more or less resistance does a cubic micrometer of copper have versus a cubic millimeter of copper? Okay, so I'm going to do the second part. How much more or less resistance does the cubic micrometer have versus the cubic millimeter? Okay, so I'm going to use our scaling laws to do that. So Remember our equation for the resistive, resistance was rho L over A, and that scales as 1 over D, okay, in, uh, by the discussion that I had before. So a micrometer is 10 to the minus 6 meters, and a millimeter is 10 to the minus 3 meters. We're taking our characteristic dimension D um, there as 10 to the minus 6 and 10 to the minus 3. And so that means that the scaling would be 10 to the 6 for the micrometer and 10 to the 3 for the millimeter. Okay, so that would imply that our cubic micrometer is going to be about a thousand times more resistive than our cubic millimeter. And you can see that this would only increase as we uh, shrink down the scale of that characteristic dimension. All right, so let's go over some other scaling laws that might be important as we continue our study of nanoscience. Um, most of these equations that I'm going to show you here are from the 1000 level physics courses and electricity and magnetism that you might have had, the introductory physics courses. So if you're wondering about the source of some of these equations, basically any introductory physics text that contains electricity and magnetism would have these equations for you, okay? All right, so let's talk about power in an electrical component. Um, the power in an electrical component in a circuit would be P is equal to the current times the voltage IV, which is equal to I squared R, which is equal to V squared over R. So we can take this in any one of those three forms. Here let's focus on I squared R because we already know what the scaling law is for the resistance. Okay, so what we would see here is that via P is equal to I squared R, the current is going to scale as D. And if you think about it, um, that makes sense. As you uh, increase the size of your object, 
it's able to carry more and more current. So our current is going to scale as the characteristic dimension, and the resistance is going to scale, as already discussed, 1 over that characteristic dimension. So since we're squaring the current, that means that our scaling equation for power would be d squared, right, times 1 over d, and so the power scales as the characteristic, characteristic dimension d, okay? So hopefully that makes sense to you. Let's also talk about capacitance, okay? Remember that the capacitance of a material is um, if you have a charge running through the circuit for a while, charge builds up on the capacitor over time, and then the energy is stored in the form of that charge and the electric field that forms as a result of the charge storage. So the equation for a basic capacitor, we'll call it the parallel plate capacitor, is shown here. The capacitance for a parallel plate capacitor is epsilon A over D. Now here epsilon is the permittivity of uh, the uh, dielectric that you have in your capacitor. If it's a vacuum, then the uh, permittivity of free space, which is 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12 in SI units, is what you would use. But if you have a different kind of material in there, then you would use the permittivity for whatever your material is. These things are considered to be material constants and can be looked up, okay, in those 1,000 level physics texts. So that's epsilon. It doesn't scale. We're going to assume that that doesn't change with material size, although it might, okay, that's something that you would need to check. But we're going to assume that that's held constant as it scales. So that means that our capacitance would be proportional to the cross-sectional area divided by D, which is the um, distance in between the capacitor plates. So that means that our capacitance would scale as d squared over d, okay, if we take our characteristic dimension there, and that means that the capacitance scales as d, the characteristic dimension. This kind of makes sense, because if you think about it, the amount of charge that you could store on a capacitor would of course increase as the size of the capacitor increases. Okay, now that we've discussed capacitors, we can discuss electrostatic actuation. So microelectromechanical systems, also known as MEMS, they use a lot of electrostatic actuation. Basically what I mean by electrostatic actuation is that if you have a micro machine or a nano machine even, then you've got to get it to, say, move in some way. Now how are you going to do that? If you use the buildup of charge, Coulomb's law of forces type stuff to get your part to move, that's electrostatic actuation. Okay. So in order to understand this um, property in a little bit more depth, let's talk about the simplest possible case, okay? And that's going to be, say, a parallel plate capacitor type actuator, okay? So let's just assume that that's the case. Now, in this kind of capacitor um, uh, actuator, you might expect that one plate would be held fixed, and then the other plate would be um, able to move based upon the fixed plate. Okay, so for example, you might vary the voltage that comes into your fixed plate, which would cause your other plate to move. Okay, so let's examine that scenario. So I've got a little sketch for you here. Basically, what we've got is we're calling the blue plate our fixed plate. Okay, let's assume that that one is the one that gets the buildup of positive charge. It doesn't really matter. Okay, so let's just assume positive. Now, let's assume that the red plate is the one that is allowed to move. And of course, in a capacitor, one plate would be positively charged and one plate would be negatively charged in this simple scenario. Okay? Now, what I've got sketched out there is the electric field lines coming off of our blue positively charged plate. So, for an infinite sheet that's got a certain surface charge density on it, what you can assume is that the electric field points out perpendicular from the plate to the capacitor in either direction. And so that's what I have drawn here with these little blue arrows. Okay, so that's the electric field coming off of our blue positively charged plate. Okay, now from our introductory physics classes, we learn that the electric field from an infinite uh, plate with a surface charge sigma, where sigma is the charge per unit area on the plate, right? that the electric field for that situation is sigma over 2 epsilon. Now here yet again, sigma is the surface charge density or the amount of charge Q per unit area of your plate, and epsilon is the permittivity of the material. Now most of them 
Uh, you might have air, you might have a vacuum, you might have a dielectric in there, but whatever, permittivity of that material, that's the line, okay? So E, the electric field, is equal to sigma over 2 epsilon. Now we're going to plug in here and uh, to be able to do the dimensional analysis a little bit better, and we're going to say that that's equal to Q over 2AE, okay? Now that electric field there, that's the electric field in between the plates, which is the one that electric field is going to cause that force on my movable red plate over here. How much force? Well, the equation for force, um, relating force to electric field, is the force is equal to the charge times the electric field. Okay? So, F is equal to QE, so that means that our equation for force, plugging in for our electric field, would be Q squared over 2A epsilon. Okay? Now, how much charge is it going to have? Well, that's going to depend upon the equation for capacitance. So the capacitance here uh, is equal, C is equal to Q over V. That's our basic equation for capacitance from, you know, our introductory physics courses. So if we solve for Q, then Q is equal to C times V. V is the voltage that you apply in between the plates of the capacitor, and C is that capacitance. So now plugging in for the force there, we have the force is equal to CV squared over 2A epsilon. Now, we've already uh, shown the equation for capacitance for a parallel plate capacitor. I plug in for that there. So now I have the force is equal to epsilon A over D squared times V squared over 2A epsilon. Okay? So that gives me an equation for the force on that um, red movable plate of epsilon A V squared over 2 D squared. So now that I have it broken down into the uh, components that are the simplest as I possibly can get it, let's do the dimensional analysis on that force equation and see how it's going to scale. So if we look at this, the voltage um, for electrostatic actuators is not going to be considered dimensionless anymore. Now why would that be? Well, we can consider a voltage in general to be something that has no real dimension. In other words, you apply a voltage to it and it goes. But the problem is that for an electrostatic actuator like a parallel plate capacitor, if you apply too much voltage to a little capacitor, you'll get a spark, you'll get a breakdown, okay? So you can't dial the voltage up too much. That means that the voltage is going to be limited by that breakdown voltage. Now remember that there's, um, in, from your introductory physics courses, that the breakdown voltage or the maximum possible voltage that you can apply is equal to the electric field times the distance in between the plates, okay? And that uh, is strength, okay, of the, of the field is going to be given in tables in your intro physics textbook for that electric field there, okay, that maximum electric field strength, okay? So that's our E max, and that's a dimensionless quantity. It's just a material property. So that means that our Vmax scales as our characteristic dimension, okay? So here, the force is going to be equal to um, epsilon A V squared over 2D squared. That'll scale epsilon dimensionless, okay? A, the area, is going to scale as D squared. V now is going to scale as D, and so when you square it, you've got another D squared. And then on the bottom, the distance in between the capacitor planes scales as the characteristic dimension d squared. So once you cancel all that out, the force for electrostatic actuation is going to scale as d squared. Okay? Hope that was clear. If it wasn't, be sure to pause me, right? And then go back over it later again and make sure that you understand. Okay. When you're dealing with magnetic forces, then a lot of times you have to think about inductors, okay? Remember that an inductor is the circuit component that stores energy by the magnetic field when current flows through it, okay? Now, the specific inductance, L, of an inductor depends upon the geometry, just like the specific capacitance, C, depends upon the geometry. However, although it does uh, change via the geometry, both the inductance and the capacitance still have the same dimensional analysis no matter what. So if we extract a scaling law for, say, one capacitor, we did the parallel plate capacitor, the simple parallel plate capacitor, then all of the equations for capacitance should scale in that way. Similarly, for an inductor, we're going to do a simple inductor. I chose a solenoid here because 
people see them all the time, right? Um, and so if we can figure out what the scaling is for one particular inductor, then we have the scaling law for all inductors because the units are the same, okay? So for a solenoid, the equation for the inductance is mu, the permeability of the material, which is the material property, times the number of turns in your inductor, capital N, squared, times the cross-sectional area of our inductor, divided by the length of the inductor, okay? Now, if you assume that mu n n don't scale, they're dimensionless, right? Then we can figure out what the uh, dimensional analysis of our inductor is. So here, a would scale as d squared, and the length of the inductor would scale as d. So that means that our equation for inductance would scale as d, okay? Now, let's then talk about magnetic forces for actuation. Electrostatic is actually a little bit more common, and that's because it's easier to make electrostatic devices than the ones that use magnetic forces for actuation. But it does happen, so it deserves a discussion. So what force would we have here? Well, in this case, it's easiest to extract the force from electrostatic actuation from the equation for the potential energy for an inductor. So the potential energy, or the amount of energy stored that an inductor can store, would be U is equal to 1 half times the inductance L times the current flowing through that device I squared, okay? Now, if we wanted to take the uh, spatial derivative of this, let's assume that the current has no spatial dependence. And so that means that when I take the derivative of this equation, the only thing that um, would have a spatial dependence to it would be the inductance, okay? So our equation for the force would then be proportional to 1 half times the partial of L with respect to X, say, let's say that X is our, di our direction of interest, times I squared, okay? Now, we've already figured out how the inductance scales, right? It scales with D. So if the inductor, if you're taking the partial of that with respect to X, then basically, in a way, you're kind of dividing out by D. So partial L with respect to X would then be dimensionless, okay? So that means that the force would scale as the current. We've already said that the current scales as d, and so that means that our force is proportional to that i squared, which is proportional or scales as the characteristic dimension d squared. All right. Well, I hope that makes sense. If not, remember that uh, you can go back, pause me, review the notes, and also it's always helpful to read the textbook. A lot of this information is covered in Chapter 2 of our textbook, and so I'll see you then. See you around.